We are pleased to welcome retired Colonel Tom Bossler to present our first talk of the day, entitled, Whose Hallowed Ground? The Farms That Became a Battlefield. His newest book, A Field Guide to Gettysburg, which he co-wrote with Dr. Carol Reardon, guides readers through experiencing the Gettysburg battlefield through its history, places, and people. Colonel Bossler is a combat veteran and retired U.S. Army officer, former director of the U.S. Army Military History Institute, and a licensed battlefield guide. He and his wife, Barbara, also own and operate the 60-acre Mountain View Farm, where they raise prize-winning purebred and registered beef cattle. Please join me in welcoming retired Colonel Tom Bossler. Thanks, Cindy. And uh, for those of you here uh, on this uh, great 4th of July, the rain coming down, um, you know, when we have a cattle sale, we always say we want it to rain when we have the cattle sale because no, no one will be in the fields and they'll come to the sale, you see. And so uh, having you here uh, in the rain, it's going to clear up. It'll clear up later on this afternoon, but uh, I appreciate you coming out in this for your first talk of the day. Um, Carol, please wave higher. There's Carol. Carol's here with us today. So... My presentation this morning is going to be a little bit different from, from those that you're going to have perhaps uh, the remainder of today and tomorrow, but uh, we're not going to talk a lot about tactics and, and who, who shot who from where and, and maneuvering, and, and we're going to go back and, uh, and talk about uh, the people who lived here. And here's a shot of the, the book cover, and, and the book that Carol and I put together, published in 2013, 35 stops. The battlefield is divided in 35 stops. At each stop, we ask and answer six questions. You can see the list of questions. The top three are usually addressed in most any book that you, uh, that you want to read about Gettysburg or the American Civil War. The bottom three, though, perhaps in a lot of those books uh, is non-existent uh, in those books. Uh, who lived here? Uh, who fell here? And what they say about it later are features of the book that uh, for, our, uh, for Carol and I are, are features that we wanted to have added for very, very personal reasons. And uh, we both had ancestors who fought in the American Civil War. We both had ancestors who died in the American Civil War. So who fell here certainly uh, uh, is one of those things that we wanted to, wanted to talk about. And it also gives us a chance uh, to talk about uh, the privates and the corporals and the sergeants, not just the colonels and the generals. And so that's very important. And of course, what they say about it later, uh, go back and get some, some personal uh, remembrances of what happened. Now, those personal remembrances are very valuable. I don't know where you were on the 4th of July 45 years ago. All right? I know exactly where I was. And I know, I remember, we did have fireworks that night. All right? And it wasn't the pretty blue thing shooting boy all the way up in the... These things were going sideways, going horizontal. So, yeah, personal remembrances were very important. And then there's another feature of the book is who lived here. Those of you of a certain age will remember a television drama program uh, back in the, can I say, 1950s? called I Led Three Lives. Remember, we've got Herbert Philbrick, the FBI informant infiltrated the Communist Party in the United States, and, uh, and he, led, he led three lives. I've led three lives. And uh, all that ties back into the uh, part that's highlighted here in that who lived here. As, uh, of course, as a soldier and being on actual battlefields, live battlefields, uh, as I just mentioned, uh, you get a certain sense of uh, the land, the property. And it leads you to ask the questions, perhaps not at the moment, but later, uh, 
Who owned that property? Who owned that farm? Who owned those fields? Who owned that house that got burned? And so, you know, you kind of go back and, and think about that and say, gee, I wish, I wish I'd known. I can point on the map where, where it was, but I, I don't know anything about the people that, were, that had lived there before we got there and after we left. So there uh, is my input from my life as a soldier. Um, battlefield guide, yep, 17 years. I had uh, a lady ask me once. No, nah, she didn't ask. She made a statement to me that always kind of stuck with me. And the statement was that she thought it was uh, very considerate, very considerate of the commanders of both of these armies to hold the battle in a national park. <laughs> now, we were almost done with the tour by the time she made that statement, so I'm thinking, whoa, wait a minute. Uh, perhaps I wasn't clear. We had to back up. Uh, and I explained to her, no, no these, these were someone's farms. People lived here before, before all this took place, and they're going to try to live here afterwards. And so we finally, we finally got that cleared up. Not to pick on the ladies, I'll give you one more for the guys. Standing at the, uh, at the angle, at the high water mark of the Confederacy, and that monument, walking back to the bus, a gentleman asked me, I don't understand. Where did all that water come from, and how high did it actually get? <laughs> Folks, I'm serious. All right? I'm serious. And then the third component, of course, is, is uh, as Cindy mentioned in the, the, the introduction, uh, Barbara and I have a 60-acre farm out here. And when we started that in 1999 after the Army, uh, all we had was an 1892 barn and cornfields and soybean fields. That was it. So we're going to build a new house. 30 years in the Army, traveling around the world. You know, the woman, the, uh, the woman that, uh, that you are related to by marriage, one of the ways to keep her in the marriage is to promise her now, the house she always wanted. So, uh, but thinking about that and all the work, building the house, building two more barns and, and putting the farm together. So the thinking is, what if a battle came through this property with all that blood, sweat, and tears invested in it? And uh, that is kind of the motivation to do what we've done here. So there it is. You're familiar with the terrain. Uh, 6,000 acres of ground, key terrain indicated there. Within that property, within, within those lines, is the, the uh, 35 farms that we spoke of. And really, I think we go out, out oftentimes onto the battlefield and, and see it, but, but don't realize what I'm about to tell you here. And that's what uh, a little bit about, not all 35 farms, but I've picked some of them out that we can, we can take a look at. Um, this summary of who was here, at least as I understand it, yeah, you can quarrel some with the numbers. Uh, there's lots of quarrel, uh, perhaps, with these, but uh, that's who's going to be here. Summarize it by saying 160,000 men, 72,000 horses and mules, over 600 cannon, hundreds and hundreds of wagons will be in these fields out here over these 6,000 acres. We're going to start by going out to, uh, out to the first day's field. And the way the, maps, the way the maps are set up is I show you the main roads. I show you the wooded areas. I show you property lines. That's, that'll be the dotted lines that go across there. And the, the dotted lines representing the boundaries, which we found on a map here in the archives. Uh, at, uh, uh, at the Visitor Center and also at the Adams County Historical Society. So we got, uh, we got some idea of, of who owned what. And we've, come, we've come up with some uh, interesting uh, uh, revelations as we write in the book that what we often think of as McPherson's Woods is actually Herbst Woods, owned by John Herbst and not by Edward, Edward McPherson. So let's go all the way out to, uh, let's go all the way out to an area between Willoughby Run and uh, Her Ridge. Out to the Abraham Spangler Farm. 
Today, uh, of course, you won't see that farm. What you will see is a, uh, a senior citizen's uh, home and some apartment buildings out there. And that sits on what was then uh, the, the Spangler farm. Uh, Federal cavalry, uh, cavalry initially uh, deployed along successive ridge lines of Knoxland and Her Ridge west of the farm on June 30th, as we know, and early in the morning of July 1st. As Colonel William Gamble, Brigade, uh, Brigadier General John Buford's Cavalry Brigade commander on this front reported, he said, quote, our skirmishers fighting under cover of trees and fences were sharply engaged, did good execution, and retarded the progress of the enemy as much as could possibly be expected. Some of the trees and fences mentioned by Colonel Gamble were part of the Abraham Spangler farm. The axis of advance, uh, Harry Heath's Confederate division along the Chambersburg Pike on the morning of July 1st passed through the property. The family stayed in the cellar of their home during the fighting. Sadie Hoffman, a granddaughter of Abraham Spangler, later described their experience. Quote, we were cozy enough and we were together, but an awful conflict was happening outside in the yard around the house, terrible screams of men uh, and screams of shells. We sat and silently prayed most of the time to keep ourselves together. Grandfather kept praying aloud that the war might, might soon end and that we would have union under God. Later in the afternoon when the sound of the fighting uh, died down and the battle passed to the east, the family emerged from the cellar only to find that they were behind Confederate lines. And they would remain so for three more days. Prior to the Confederate retreat, on July 4th uh, and 5th, the house became a temporary hospital and the fields became a burial ground for the dead. So you can imagine going back then with that family after the battle and trying to, and trying to recover uh, from, from the damage that was done there, the burials that are there, uh, and it's gonna be a severe, severe problem uh, for them. Moving a little uh, closer back to town, I think most of us are familiar with the, with the McPherson farm, uh, owned by uh, Edward McPherson and, and located on, uh, on of course, the, the namesake McPherson's Ridge. Uh, today, of course, the farm is closely identified with a large white bank barn uh, on the south side of the Chambersburg Pike and the statues of Generals Buford and Reynolds on the opposite side of the road. Fire destroyed the farmhouse in 1895 and the outbuildings have been removed. The barn, of course, has been preserved through great measures like a lot of you folks have participated in over the years and keeping that barn looking as in fine shape as it looks uh, out here today. Here along the ridge extending to the right and left uh, of the road, Buford posted Gamble's tired troopers for a final stand. He also posted here four of the six cannon belonging to Lieutenant John Calif's Battery A 2nd U.S. Artillery. Uh, and one section uh, on each side of the road. At about 9.30 a.m., Confederate Division Commander Harry Heath began to deploy his Confederate infantry and artillery on Hers Ridge, 1,200 yards to the west of the McPherson Farm. The batteries of Major uh, William uh, Pegram's artillery battalion, approximately 21 cannon, also wheeled into position on Hers Ridge. After a brief artillery exchange, Heath advanced two of his infantry brigades from Hers Ridge toward McPherson's Ridge. Uh, and uh, after crossing the Willoughby Run, the Confederates advanced and entered the pastures and fields of the McPherson property. Joe Davis's 1,700 Mississippians advanced west to east north of the Pike, while Archer's Alabama and Tennessee Brigade of nearly 1,200 men did the same south of the road. While Buford's cavalry, armed with single-shot breech-loading carbines, enjoyed a more rapid rate of fire than the muzzle-loading rifles of the Southerners, the Confederates' num numerical superiority in troops engaged clearly gave them an important advantage, but they did not enjoy it for long. Buford's men had bought enough time for Major General John Reynolds to arrive on the field with the Federal infantry. And so the battle is going to continue uh, into, into the afternoon. Edward McPherson, uh, of course, is like many of the landowners here on these farms, is an absentee landlord. He owns the property, but the farm is operated by a tenant farmer. And uh, McPherson is not here for the battle. 
Uh, he's down in Washington in his new job as Deputy Director of the Internal Revenue Bureau. Lest we forget that Abraham Lincoln, the great emancipator, uh, will impose upon the American people a tax on their income to pay for the war. 3% flat tax on all income over $800 a year, period. You could write it on one sheet of paper. Let's go back to those times. Yeah. So, prior to the start of the battle, the John Slentz family fled to town to seek refuge and remained there until the battle was over. Upon returning, they found that both the house and barn were being used as temporary hospitals, and the house had been ransacked. Subsequently, the Slentz family lived at the Lutheran Theological Seminary in the home of seminary president, Dr. Simon Schmucker. They lived there for three months while the farm was repaired and the house again uh, made livable. In a letter dated August 10, 1863, Slentz informed absentee landlord McPherson that the bodies of the, uh, of the dead soldiers are, quote, still laying there yet, and they won't let any be raised until the 1st of October. What's important about the 1st of October? That's when the burials begin in the National Cemetery, Soldiers National Cemetery, you see. They'll start lifting the bodies buried in temporary graves and moving it to that location, to the, to the cemetery. Slentz continues, he said, I would give $1,000 if I had it. If I was back on your place and fixed as I was on the 29th of June, I had a fair prospect for a good summer crop, but all is gone now, unquote. Uh, six weeks later, Slentz advised McPherson that it would take 13,600 linear feet. Folks, that's two and a half miles, laid end to end, of six inch boards. And 900 uh, wooden posts to replace the farm fences that were destroyed during the battle. Now that is really indeed, indeed significant uh, impact on the McPherson operation, but the Slentz family will come back to the farm and operate the farm uh, for, for McPherson. Let's go to yet another place on the, uh, uh, on the first day's field, and that is the Emanuel uh, Harmon Farm, which if you haven't uh, followed it closely, is now uh, available for us to go out and interpret that part of the field. Uh, and uh, Carol and I hope that uh, in, the, in the coming year we can update our field guide to include this property and its interpretive value. You may remember this as the former uh, Gettysburg Country Club property that now is Park Service property. So the Harmon Farm was situated 1,100 yards southwest of the McPherson Farm along Old Mill Road about 250 yards west of Willoughby Run and 400 yards east of the present-day Country Club Lane. Structures on the farm were described as a large brick house topped with a cupola, a stone barn, a two-story brick wash house, a smoke house, and a corn crib. Teenager Amelia Harmon was in the home when her aunt, with, her, with her aunt when the fighting started, and they observed firsthand the bloody action swirling around them. Later, she related her experiences in an article for the Gettysburg Compiler newspaper. And she said, quote, We were living that tragic morning of the battle in the big colonial mansion known as the Old McLean Place, situated on the highest point of the bluff overlooking Willoughby Run. We had decided to remain in the house, even in the uncertain event of a battle, for our house was of the old-fashioned fortress type with 18-inch walls and heavy wooden shutters. My aunt and myself, then but a schoolgirl, were quite alone, our farmer having gone away with the horses in the hopes of hiding them in the vastness of the hills, unquote. So about 9 o'clock is when the, action, when the action started. And uh, Amelia and her aunt watched the fighting from a second floor window uh, and then from the cupola on the roof. Federal cavalry uh, had gone through the farm, and pretty soon they came back and took positions around the farm buildings and in the house and barn, and an officer ordered the ladies into the basement into the cellar of the house for their own safety. Advancing Confederate skirmishers forced the cavalry back to the east, and Confederate infantry in turn occupied the house uh, and the barn, using the upper levels as positions from which to fire into the lines of Biddle's Federal, Federal Infantry Brigade, uh, which by now had occupied a line on the southern end of McPherson's Ridge, just north of the Fairfield-Hagerstown Road. Soon Company K to the 80th New York 
uh, advance forward of uh, Biddle's brigade line, cross will be run and forced the Confederates out of the Harmon buildings. Company G of the same regiment was sent to reinforce Company K, but both companies were soon surrounded by Confederate infantry. The Federal skirmishers were forced to withdraw through a ravine to the south and eventually returned back to the brigade line. Uh, the advance of J. Johnson Pettigrew's Confederate Brigade to the east against Biddle's Brigade once again brought the Confederates through the Harmon Farm property. Soldiers of the 52nd North Carolina burned the Harmon buildings so that federal sharpshooters could not use them again. Amelia and her aunt escaped the burning buildings, survived the fighting, and found refuge behind Confederate lines until the battle ended. The farm buildings having been completely burned to the ground. So uh, certainly a significant loss for, uh, for the, the Harmon family. John Herbst, his farm was 1,200 yards south-southwest of the McPherson farm, 600 yards uh, southeast of the Harmon farm. It consisted of 110 acres. While the neighboring McPherson farm clearly survived massive damage to its major structures, Herbst would not be able to report such happy results. The rival battle lines crossed his farm for the better part of six hours on July 1st. In June 1864, John Herbst detailed the destruction uh, on his property in preparation for uh, submitting a damage claim to the federal government. He wrote that a portion of the 1st Army Corps of the, of the Army of the Potomac occupied his farm and around his house and barn during the battle, and that he and his family took shelter in the cellar, there being a great deal of uh, firing about the buildings that federal troops were compelled to fall back, and the rebels took possession of the place. Then he came out of the cellar and was met by a rebel soldier or officer of low grade who told him he was ordered to burn the buildings on account of the Yankees having been firing from them, and that the rebel soldier had set fire to the barn while already burning, insisted on burning the house. But they also found that there were wounded men in the house, one of whom was a federal soldier and two rebels who had been carried into the house and who begged him not to burn the house. So the house, in this case, was saved. The barn was not. The barn was a big barn, 80 feet by 45 feet, uh, typical Pennsylvania bank barn that you see uh, uh, in the countryside locally. It included two threshing floors with stabling in the basement. Herbst also lost a four-horse thre uh, threshing machine, a reaper and a mower, eight sets of horse equipment, a windmill, a wheelbarrow, a cultivator, two plows, a corn fork, plus his milk cows, and beef cattle herd and foodstuffs that had been set aside for the family. All of it gone. Uh, as we find in, in, uh, in a lot of these cases, and Carol and I are doing research on the next field guide, which is the Battle of Antietam, uh, in a lot of these cases, the damage that uh, occurs to these properties is direct damage, as John Herbst just uh, experienced here with, uh, w with his barn being burned down and all the equipment inside and the cattle being taken. We also see a lot of damage when we have an occupying army that remains after the battle. And this is more true of Antietam than of Gettysburg, where the Federal Army under McClellan stays in the area for, for weeks, and President Lincoln can't get him to move to go back into Virginia. Uh, uh, well, the, the men and the animals have to be fed from some source, and that source turned out to be the local, the local farms. So subsequently, Herbst filed a damage claim with the state and federal governments. And our system was set up, a formal system was set up uh, for damage claims to be paid. But it was a very strict, very rigid uh, methodology in the process. Neighbors John Herding and Henry Steinauer substantiated Herbst's claims and signed written statements as to uh, uh, their testimony on his behalf. He only filed for damages amounting to, in, uh, at the time he filed, $2,689.36. And this is going to be about 1867 when he files his claim. Folks, that's uh, in $2,014, $2,689 is $52,300. Uh, and he will get a settlement uh, of uh, just over $2,600. So he's going to lose some. John Herbst is extremely 
lucky and sing, uh, singular in the fact that he is going to be compensated in some, uh, in some fashion. So let's move on to, uh, let's move on to day two. Here's the terrain. Again, the property lines divided, uh, indicated by the, by the uh, dashed line. And you can see some of the key features here on the south end of the battlefield, some of the key farms that we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about just a few of those uh, here uh, for the second day of the battle. And we're going to deal first with, uh, with the Rose Farm. Uh, by the time of the fight over on the Rose Farm, after sunset on July 2nd, 11 different Federal Infantry Brigades from three different infantry corps participating in the fighting in just Rose's wheat field. For sheer carnage, few sites on the Gettysburg battlefield uh, exceeded those experienced in that, in that wheat field. Uh, an estimated 6,000 men were killed, or wounded or captured in that 24-acre field, giving the Rose Farm the title of the bloodiest farm in North America by the time the sun set on July 2nd. Uh, survivors of the fight provided uh, vivid memories of the action for decades after, uh, a after the fight. Private w William Stilwell of the 53rd Georgia in Sam's Brigade wrote home in a letter on July 10th. He wrote home, our regiment, quote, our regiment had lost heavy and more officers, officers than I knew. Lieut Lieutenant Colonel Hance was killed. Captain Bond from Butts County and several more were now, uh, now not remembered. Captain Brown was shot through the leg between the knee and the ankle. Lieutenant Farrar through, th through the thigh. Sile Walker, Gus Brandon, George Fields, James Fryer, and several more were wounded, all of whom were doing well, except James Fryer. He died. He continues, he says, I forgot to say that General Sims was wounded through the thigh. I helped carry him off the field. He said I was a faithful man. Oh, the horror of war. Who can tell if this war lasts much longer? There won't be any of us left. So that gives you a, really a, kind of an idea of the nature of the fighting. The house barn and the outbuildings of the farm became a hospital. And the slopes around them became a graveyard for many soldiers that fell. Rose was a physician and gentleman farmer from Maryland. He had purchased the property of 230 acres uh, from Jacob Scherfee in 1858. At the time of the battle, George's brother John and tenant farmer Francis Ogden actually uh, operated the farm, worked the farm, and lived there with their families uh, li living in the, in the stone house, which still stands there today. After the battle, George Rose, John Rose, and Francis Ogden each filed damage claims with the federal government, the total sum exceeding $4,500. That's $87,500. They received no payment. All three men continued to file damage claims as late as the 1870s and early 1880s. Uh, all were disapproved by the Quartermaster General's Office for the same reasons that explain why they rejected so many similar claims. That is, specifically, that office would not pay for any item not considered to be Quartermaster stores, which automatically excluded personal property and home furnishings or any item that the claimant could not certify had been actually received or taken for the use of and used by the United States Army. Thus, the quartermaster's office would not reimburse for, mat uh, for material destroyed during the battle or used in the extended care of wounded soldiers. J. Howard Wirt, uh, a newspaperman, later recalled his visit to the farm after the battle. And he wrote, quote, I was on the Rose Farm and around the Rose buildings immediately after hostilities ceased. A much disgusted man was Rose when he returned. His stock was gone. His furniture was gone. His house was filled with vermin. His supply of drinking water polluted with dead bodies. Nothing left of his farm but the rocks and some of the soil. Nearly 100 Confederates were buried in his garden. Some 175 were buried behind the barn and around the wagon shed. The half body, uh, the, the half of a body sent asunder by a spherical case shot was in his spring water from which they drew their drinking water. Graves were everywhere, one Confederate colonel being buried within a yard of the kitchen door." Unquote. The Rose Farm went on the real estate market in 1866. A newspaper advertisement noted, quote, 
Its fine location with the springs and grove would make a most admirable site for a summer resort or a boarding house for parties during the summer. It is located near the Round Top and on that part of the battlefield where the conflict raged, giving it an historical interest which may be of great value to the new owner. So, moving along, let's look at, uh, let's look at the farm owned by Joseph Scherfe. Uh, it sits 700 yards north of the Rose Farmhouse and on the west side of the road, as, as most of you recognize it when you're out there. Uh, Fifty years old at the time of the battle, Joseph Scherfe had purchased the property in 1842 and built the two-story brick house that still stands today. Uh, the barn, however, is not original. Uh, that barn present during the battle, that barn burned, and the barn that sits there today has been reconstructed on that site. The Reverend Scherfe, he was a deacon in the Church of the Brethren, and his wife Mary raised six children, three boys and three girls, on that farm. Mary's mother, Mrs. Catherine Hagen, also lived with them at the time of the battle. Now, Sheriffy's peach orchard had become famous even before the battle. You know, there's lots of orchards. I think probably it's safe to say that, that uh, most, if not all, of the farms out here had their own fruit orchards. Uh, and, and these guys uh, and, and gals that are living out here, this is sustainment farming. They farm to feed the family, to, to, to feed the family, and, and uh, it's, it's not always their, sing the, their singular occupation, but quite often uh, it's just sustainment type of farming. In this case, with Sherfy's Peach Orchard, this is commercial farming. It's a significant enough operation that, in fact, uh, his peach orchard was on the Adams County map uh, of that era. Uh, so this is, a, this is a pretty big deal for them. When the battle began on July 1st, Sherfy sent the children to safety uh, at the John Trostel farm southeast of Little Round Top. Joseph himself uh, provided water to federal troops as they marched along the Emmitsburg Road on July 1st while Mary and her mother baked bread for the soldiers. On the morning of July 2nd, Joseph and the two women were ordered off the farm by federal officers. They made their way to two taverns southeast of Gettysburg to wait out the battle. The afternoon of July 2nd, the Sherpy property along the Emmitsburg Road, of course, was occupied, occupied by federal troops and you've got all the fighting that's going to go on there uh, again in, in uh, uh, Barksdale's Mississippi Brigade when they make their attack will pass right through there. There's a great image that one of the, one of the historical artists did, I think it was Don Troiani, of, of, uh, of them going right through the, the, the Scherfe uh, property. Joseph Scherfe and his son Raphael returned to the home on July 6th and the rest of the family followed the next day. The family witnessed a scene of destruction and desolation. The barn was in ashes. The house, while still standing, was riddled with shot and shell. The fencing was down and much of it gone, and the shrubbery and peach trees were nearly destroyed. In the ashes of the barn, the charred bodies of 14 men were found who had been wounded and had taken refuge there, uh, but did not escape the conflagration of the fire. In a claim filed after the war, damages uh, to the farm were estimated at almost $2,500. Uh, 2014 dollars, that's 48,600 dollars. On the east side of the Emmitsburg Road, north of the Scherfe farm, uh, is the farm of Daniel Klingel. In April of 1863, talk about bad timing, April of 1863, Klingel acquired the house and farm property from Ludwig Essig, the original owner. The house was a two-story, six-room structure made of logs. His 15-acre property resembled a rectangle 180 yards wide with the Emmitsburg Road as the western boundary and 410 yards long with the present-day United States Avenue at its southern boundary. On July 2nd, before the Confederate attack, Union officers urged, urged Klingel to flee with his family to a place of safety. He allegedly responded, if I must die, I will die at home. Uh, in due time, though, Klingel will take his family to a friend's home near Rock Creek. By midday, midday of July 2nd, federal troops fill, uh, filled the Klingel property, busily preparing to defend the line along the Emmitsburg Road. Men from the 16th Massachusetts Infantry went into Klingel's house to make firing slits between the logs, using their bayonets 
to make uh, holes in the chinking uh, through which they could both see and shoot, uh, uh, see out and shoot their weapons. Surviving veterans described how they used the house as a fort after they had perforated the house in several places. When he returned after the battle, Daniel Klingel found the house in shambles. He subsequently filed a federal damage claim for the loss of his household goods, a large number of pairs of shoes and shoe leather, in addition to farming. Uh, Daniel Klingel was also a shoe, uh, shoemaker. And damage to his crops, buildings, and fields. He cited the loss of a cow, three and a half acres of corn, three and a half acres of oats, two acres of Timothy grass. In September of 1863, he advertised the property for sale and in March 1867, uh, Joseph J. Smith obtained a deed for the Klingel uh, farmhouse and, and three parcels of land. In 1885 and 1887, the Gettysburg Battlefield Memorial Association bought portions of the Klingel farm and incorporated them into the Gettysburg uh, Battlefield Memorial Park holdings. And it remained a tenant house through uh, the, uh, the 20th century. In 2011, the National Park Service completed a renovation of the, of the property, and I suppose a lot of you saw that going on when it was happening. Let's move to the Trostal Farm. Here's a very interesting one, really uh, quite something. So 650 yards east of the Sheriff uh, Farm are the house and the barn of the Trostal Farm. At the time of the battle, the farm was owned by Peter Trostal, a resident of Straban Township, east of Gettysburg. If you uh, go out to uh, uh, Route 30, out York Street, you know where the Sheets is there just before you get to, uh, get to Route 15. Well, behind where the Sheets property is today, that's where uh, Peter Trussell's uh, primary farm was. In this case, the farm we're talking about, he didn't live in it. Uh, his uh, son, Abraham, and his family resided there uh, and had been there since 1849. And Abraham uh, and uh, his wife, Catherine, and their nine, at least nine children uh, lived on the farm in a rent-to-own investment. Abraham was to pay his father a grand total of $153.33 a year to live on the property. In other words, he's paying the taxes, you see, on the property. Um, so they had nine kids, uh, at least as of the census of 1860. Abraham and Catherine, nine children, two more added before the battle. They were busy folks. The 1860 census also recorded six horses, nine cows, eight other cattle, 22 sheep, and 21 swine on the farm. An August 1860 sale notice in a local newspaper described the farm as follows. Quote, containing 145 acres more or less, the improvements on which are a new frame dwelling house, large brick barn, and other outbuildings, a well at the barn, a well at the house, about 22 acres are in meadow, there is a due proportion of timber. So that was an 1860 sale notice. Well, the farm didn't sell. Peter couldn't sell it, and so he's still the owner. His family, his son and family is still living there at the time of the battle. Situation, situated as it was between and within the battle lines of the second day of the fighting, the farm suffered significant damage. Uh, the collapse under pressure of the, of the right wing of the Federal Corps salient line along the, on the, along the Emmitsburg Road forced retreating and withdrawing Federal infantry across the property, closely pursued by the advancing Confederates. So the farm is going to be right square in the middle of it. The Trostal family had evacuated the farm as the fighting began. When they returned after the battle, they found the farm totally devastated by the fighting. Abraham apparently was less than a solid citizen, refusing to pay the taxes on the property or the rent he owed to his father. He appeared before a judge on multiple occasions for assault and battery. In August of 1868, he faced charges of forcible entry in town. A jury found him not guilty on the grounds of mental instability, and the judge ordered him to be committed to the lunatic asylum in Harrisburg. On September 4th, 1864, Catherine Trostel, on behalf of Abraham, filed a federal claim for the loss of 27 acres of wheat, 9 of corn, 8 acres of oats, 32 acres of grass, 20 tons of hay, 3 cows, 1 heifer, 1 bull, 1 large hog, 50 chickens, as well as 15 barrels of flour, 2 barrels of ham and shoulders, beds, bedding, etc., etc. 
At least 6,400 fence rails were destroyed. And the, and the constructed earthworks put up by the soldiers were burned as firewood. So their, their total uh, exceeded $3,000. Converted to 2014, $64,300. Uh, there's no evidence that the Trostals ever were ever compensated for their losses. The final attempt to get a claim approved was Claim L, uh, 3562 uh, for $3,344, that is 81, almost 82,000, which was denied on November 28, 1878, on the same grounds as the claim I told you previously. I could not prove that it was taken for use uh, by the Army. In 1899, the heirs of Abram and Catherine Trostel uh, sold the farm to the Gettysburg National Military Park Commission for $4,500, or today's dollars, 133000 Folks, I'm going to stop there, give you time uh, for a few questions, should you have them. Yes, sir. the cost of the Union soldiers who burnt the farm and the farm Was William house. Bliss ever compensated? Right. No. And it goes all the way up into the 1900s, his attempt to get paid. He dies, his heirs pick up and try to get, try to get it done, but no. They're never, even though it was burned under orders by a federal unit. Were, were, were all the homeowners, um, did they, were they able to collect on the awards? The evidence that we found in, in, in researching for this is that um, I think it's safe to say that most of them were not, were not compensated. And they will have to, have to absorb their loss. Uh, or in the case of, uh, um, you know, the Rose Farm, well, that was enough damage that they finally decided they couldn't keep it going, and, and so it was advertised for sale. So most will, will not be compensated. Hi. Uh, I lived in the Gettysburg West apartment complex for a few years on the Abraham Spangler yeah. farm. And I often wondered that post-war house that's been recently renovated east of their driveway, was that on the foundation of any of the Spangler buildings that you know of? Um, The, the picture, the physical picture that I get, the answer would be no, that the farm was further to the west from there. Yeah. That's a nice, that's a nice property. Yeah, they did a nice job with that, restoring that house. If a lot of the farms were used uh, for hospitals, wouldn't that fall under the definition of use by the government? Would it not fall under the definition? One would think so. One would think so. But again, as I, as I referenced earlier, there's a very strict and rigid system here. One of the things that you have to have is a receipt, a paid receipt. And the quartermaster officers, and, and the, it's, in the, it's in the Army regulations, and it tells them exactly what to do, how to fill out the paperwork, a few requisition uh, items to be provided to the Army, then the, then the requisitioning officer, usually a quartermaster officer, writes a receipt to the person that's going to give up that. But that doesn't always happen. Remember, a lot of these people are going to go leave when the battle starts. By the time they come back, you know, everything's gone already. And there's no one there to uh, receipt for that property. And, of course, the other thing that you had to do, too, is you had to take uh, a loyalty oath when you made out your damage claim. And, and because they're not going to pay, certainly they're not going to pay to any to any Confederates or Confederate sympathizer. So you have to have not only your loyalty oath, but you've got to have people lined up to testify on your behalf as witnesses. Did you mention how these properties were conveyed? What happened to them afterwards, like in the 1900s? Yeah, a lot of these we have, we have record of how they eventually, through one way or another, uh, come into the uh, holdings of, of, the, of the National Park Service uh, as, as federal property. Either through the, the Gettysburg Battlefield Memorial Association 
did a lot of initial work in that regard before this was even uh, became federal property in terms of a national park. And then, of course, later the Park Service will continue, continue that effort. But in the end, a lot of these properties, uh, you know, it's like Lydia Leister's place, will be bought up uh, by the GBMA. And then when this becomes Gettysburg National Military Park, then those holdings are turned over to the federal government. The uh, short I guess the serve people. Can you hear me? I think it. Okay. The sheriff people. On. Um, I know the bond had burned down, but the stone base of that is that. I mean, that's on the spot where it stood. Are those the actual stones and everything? Yeah, the yeah, oh, yeah. Okay. They would they would rebuild as they did uh, as they did the Henry Spangler farm as an example. That's the barn you see there today. That's the third barn on that foundation. Uh, the Cordori barn uh, is at least the second barn on that same foundation. Maybe someday we can rebuild the, uh, the Rose barn uh, on the Rose, Rose property. The foundation is still there. That barn wasn't destroyed in the battle. That was burned down uh, in the early 1900s by a lightning strike. Yes, ma'am. But are some of the the farms or the properties on the battlefield still privately owned, and, and why? <laughs> I mean, are, are they supposed to be part of the of the battlefield property? Good question. I can't give you a precise answer. Uh, the Park Service certainly calls those in holdings. It's not just the farms. If you come, well, think of the Double Day Inn and the houses across the street from the Double Day Inn there. Uh, those are all privately owned. Those are in holdings uh, that are within the battle, uh, designated battlefield area. But uh, other farm properties, uh, I can't give you a precise answer this morning on that. Uh, look it up. You'll notice the cattle out there that are grazing in some of the pastures out at McPherson's Ridge and off uh, East Confederate Avenue. Uh, that's, that's a leasing operation from area farmers where we're allowed to come in and lease ground to graze those livestock over the summer at $25 a head or plant crops at $25 an acre. Now the Park Service doesn't get a lot of money for that, uh, but it, what it does is help preserve the battlefield as it might have looked in 1863, discounting of course 1,400 monuments and markers <laughs> and a lot more roads. No, I don't put my cattle down here on the battlefield because there is, uh, unfortunately, a lot of red tape involved. And 30 years in the Army, I don't like people telling me what to do anymore. You see? So I keep my cattle at home, or at least try to. We had a little bull get out, newborn, jump the fence, tw not jump, crawled under the fence twice yesterday. So, yeah, we got we to teach that boy some manners. But that won't take long. That won't take long. I think we're uh, out of time. You got one more? The property that was once next to the Klingle farm, the log house that was torn down, do you know anything about that? Next to the Klingle farm? Yeah. Sort of, uh, I don't know which, south of the Klingle farm. Um, 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 On Steinler Ave, off um, Emmitsburg Road. You're talking about the, the foundation of the Wentz house? No, no. In between those two properties, there there used to be a log house. It was a, it was torn down by the Park Service. No, you don't know anything about apparently it. I don't. <laughs> Shurfy, it was a Shurfy tenant house. There's your answer. Thank you. Okay.